Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Loopholes Second Quarter and First Half 2020 Results Conference Call. My name is Courtney, and I'll be your coordinator for today's event. For the duration of the call, your lines will be on listen only. However, at the end of the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. If at any time you need assistance, please press star zero on your telephone keypad, and you will be connected to an operator. Please ask questions during the Q&A session in the corresponding language, in Russian for the Russian line, and in English for the English line. I would also like to inform you that questions from the press will not be accepted. And I will now hand you over to Alexander Palavoda, Head of Investor Relations, to begin today's conference. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and, men, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for this conference call on look all the results for the second quarter and the first half of 2020. On today's call, we have Mr. Alexander Matetsen, CFO, Mr. Pavel Zdanov, Vice President for Finance, as well as colleagues from our accounting team. Before we move on with the presentation, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that some of the comments during this call constitute forward-looking statements involving risks, uncertainties, and other factors that may cause our actual results to be materially different from what is expressed or implied by these forward-looking statements. More detailed information is presented on the slide. Now, I would like to hand over to Mr. Alexander Matitsin. Thank you, Alexander. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The second quarter turned out to be one of the most challenging in the history of the oil and gas industry. The coronavirus pandemic led to an unprecedented slump in demand and hydrocarbon prices, as well as to imbalance of key macro parameters. We had to significantly cut production following the OPEC Plus agreement and weaker demand for gas from China, and optimize the refining throughput due to tighter crack spreads and the sharp drop in demand for jet and motor fuels. Our management team showed efficiency and flexibility despite limitations introduced because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, in this extremely challenging and volatile environment, we were able to perform well in the second quarter and once again confirm the resilience of our business. Despite an increase in the working capital, we managed to keep free cash flow positive as opposed to most of our peers. And though the company's investment program was downsized as part of our optimization efforts, it remained sufficient to implement our key projects as planned. While revenues declined by more than 40% quarter and quarter, EBITDA slid only by 4%. Moreover, the decrease in upstream EBITDA was completely offset by its growth in the downstream segment. The results were supported by both carrying over factors and our efforts to cut costs smartly reduced production by shutting the least profitable wells and quickly optimized the refining capacity utilizations coupled with strong trading performance. Net profit was significantly affected by the impairment of assets on the back of a weaker market environment. Thanks to a highly efficient business model in the second quarter of 2020, Lokoil maintained a strong leadership standing in the industry in terms of the unit financial metrics. Among our competitors, many of which boasted operating losses and negative free cash flow, I would like to note the significantly lower gap between Lukoil's EBITDA per barrel and that of international majors, which was largely attributable to the natural hedging of our Russian assets. As mobility restrictions are lifted, we see the demand for hydrocarbons recover. However, the recovery speed varies greatly depending on the type of oil products and the region. For example, our retail sales of motor fuels are only 5% lower year on year. At the same time, our two plane fueling sales decreased by 50%. Oil demand is forecasted to reach 95% of its pre crisis level as early as at the beginning of 2021, but a full recovery will take longer. It will depend on the dynamics of the COVID-19 spread and the pace of lifting the restrictions. The recovery in demand against the backdrop of production cuts by both OPEC Plus and other players has already put the oil market in deficit. As a result, we see a gradual reduction in accumulated inventories which supports oil prices. At the same time, price forecasts have improved compared to early June when we presented our results for the first quarter. 
This is primarily due to the forecasted drop on the supply side. The current market trends and forecasts demonstrate the effectiveness of our strategy aimed at maintaining free production capacity. I would like to note that today Luke Oil is perfectly positioned to derive full benefit from an improving market environment. We are prepared to increase oil production and get back to sustainable growth at any time. High margin barrels, whose profitability has been significantly affected by lower prices, are now an important driver of the financial results recovery, and it is important that we keep steadily increasing our high margin production even in the times of crisis. Look while downstream can adjust promptly to changes thanks to good access to markets, including through our own trading operations. The low base of the second quarter in terms of both refining margins and throughput allows us to significantly improve our financial results in the downstream as crack spreads recover. Next year's planned growth of the light oil product yield following the launch of new conversion facilities will provide the downstream with additional benefits from improved market conditions. In the current situation, the company has put an ever greater focus on the optimization of all expense items. I would also like to remind you of our efficient dividend policy, according to which the entire free cash flow generated in better market conditions will be paid out as dividends. Lookwell's robust financial position has traditionally been our additional competitive edge. Now, net financial debt was close to zero at the end of the reporting period. This enables us to honor all our obligations while continuing to develop the company in line with our strategy, no matter how volatile the prices are. In a highly volatile market environment, we have been working to increase the liquidity available to us. In particular, in the second quarter, we successfully placed 10-year euro bonds for 1.5 billion US dollars and significantly increased the amount of committed credit lines, which now stands at some 3 billion US dollars. In July, we paid final dividends for 2019 in the amount of over 240 billion rubles without compromising the financial stability of the company. As a reminder, the dividends were paid out from the actual free cash flow generated in the second half of 2019. During the previous call, we announced the optimization of this year's investment program. At the end of the second quarter, the actual savings amounted to some 25 billion rubles. We expect the savings um, um, to be even greater as we will move further in um, the second half of the year, and the current savings are mostly about uh, foreign projects. You may remember that the optimization mostly includes the postponement of expenditures in exploration and early stage upstream and downstream projects. To a less extent, we reduce our drilling and construction expenditures. In other words, lower capital expenditures do not affect the implementation of key projects or the achievement of the company's strategic goals. We reiterate our target for investments in 2020 in the range of 450 to 500 billion rubles, excluding the servicing project in Iraq. With um, this amount, we can quickly boost our investments in some of the projects depending on the market environment. Let me remind you that our base case plan for 2020 assumed capital expenditures of around 550 billion rubles. This means that following the optimization, our cost savings will amount to 20% in ruble terms and up to 25% in US dollar terms. In addition to optimizing our investment program, we also stepped up the efforts to cut all the company's expenses. At the end of the second quarter, almost all conditionally controllable expenses decreased in absolute terms quarter and quarter. Though the unit costs went up, this increase is attributable to a certain share of fixed costs amid a forced reduction in production volumes. This means that um, as production and refining volumes recover, the indicators will normalize. Let me stress that our cost reduction efforts do not affect any aspects of industrial safety and environmental protection, including climate change management. Following a major diesel fuel spill in the far north attributed to the Russian metallurgical industry, permafrost risk management has stepped into the limelight. Importantly, Luke Oil has been operating in the Arctic zone for many years. We leverage the most advanced technologies and take maximum responsibility for industrial safety and environmental protection. The company built its entire infrastructure in the permafrost area using specially designed technical solutions and in compliance with special standards. 
regularly monitor and control the condition of soils and production facilities. Look, while costs of maintaining infrastructure in the north are substantially higher than in permafrost-free regions. All this allows us to effectively manage permafrost risks in order to prevent environmental incidents. Finally, a few words on managing the direct risks of the coronavirus pandemic. The safety of our employees and the continuity of our business processes have been at the heart of all our considerations amid the pandemic. The steps we took enabled us to prevent any major outbreak at Lucas facilities while um, ensuring the continuity of our business processes across the board. Thank you. Now I'd like to hand over to Pavel Zdanov. Thank you, Alexander, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will present our results in the upstream segment. In the second quarter of 2020, we faced an unprecedented volatility of oil prices. Having plunged to a 20-year low of 13 U.S. dollars per barrel, Brent crude traded above 40 U.S. dollars per barrel as early as in the beginning of June. This was facilitated by the new OPEC Plus agreement. At the same time, due to the sharp decline of Russian oil supplies to Europe, Euro's crude traded at a premium to Brent. The average Euro's crude price went down 39 cent quarter and quarter. In parallel, the euro's net ruble price added 15 percent due to the tax leg effect and ruble devaluation. July and August saw further improvement in the market environment with the euro's net ruble price reaching its 2019 average. In the first half of 2020, average hydrocarbon production, excluding the West Kernel 2 project, totaled 2.2 million barrels per day, down 8.4% year-on-year. In the second quarter, we significantly cut production following the new OPEC Plus agreement and lower gas supplies from Uzbekistan to China, which was attributable to the coronavirus pandemic aftermath. However, the production of high-margin barrels continued to grow fully in line with our plans, with their share in total output in Russia rising by a 3 percentage points year-on-year. Year. Gas production in Russia also grew after the second stage of the booster compressor stations was launched, was launched at the Nahotkinsky field late last year. I would like to talk more specifically about oil production developments driven by the OPEC Plus agreement. Since May 1st, we have cut our oil production in Russia by 19%, or about 310,000 barrels per day against average daily production in the first quarter. We did so by shutting in the least profitable high water cut wells, predominantly at mature fields of West Siberia, Urals, and the Khan Republic. Let me remind you that when drafting the list of wells to be shut in, we factored in both the economic, and geological and technological factors to avoid a negative effect on the long-term production potential of our fields. Based on our experience from the previous OPEC Plus agreement and the results of the last two months, we know that the production from shut-in wells can be quickly restored without losing their potential. In particular, we have increased output by 20,000 barrels per day since the 1st of July and by another 60,000 barrels since August. Remarkably, most shut-in wells managed to restore production within a single day. We restore production based on the economics and the focus on restarting the most profitable wells. We continue uh, maintaining our production potential at about 230,000 barrels per day of free production capacity in Russia currently. So we are able to promptly restore the production back to normal and secure further sustainable growth. As the market environment deteriorated and production declined, the upstream EBITDA fell by 34% quarter and quarter and 61% in the first half of 2020. The much uh, lower quarter and quarter decline was attributable to the tax lag effect in Russia, which uh, was deeply negative in the first quarter before turning positive in the second quarter on the back of recovering oil prices. In addition to lower gas prices and output, our international assets also suffered from lower demand for gas from China, forcing the Uzbekistan projects to redirect their exports to the domestic market. That was why the second quarter results were also adversely affected by gas price adjustments in Uzbekistan in the first quarter. 
Notwithstanding the unfavorable market environment and external limitations on production, we continue to aggressively develop our priority projects. The drilling program in Caspian Sea helped us to keep production at the Yuri Kuchagin and Vladimir Filinovsky fields at the target levels. In the first half of 2020, the combined oil and gas condensate production reached 3.7 million tons, generally flat year on year. From the outset, we have successfully drilled 48 production wells, with uh, another three wells to be commissioned by the end of this year. As uh, part of the Valeri Greifer field development, shipyards continued building platforms. As at the end of June, the ice-resistant stationary platform was 48% complete and the accommodation platform was 74% complete. In May, offshore jackets for the accommodation platform were installed in the Caspian Sea. The plan for September is to install offshore jackets for the ice-resistant stationary platform as well. As a reminder, oil production is set to commence as early as in 2022. As for the Baltic Sea Shelf, um, we are finalizing the feedwork on the D33 field, with the final investment decision expected at the end of this year. High viscosity oil production in Timan Pechora was up by 4.5% year on year. In the first half of 2020, 16 SAGD production wells and uh, 157 underground wells were commissioned at the Yarikske field. The Wusinske field commissioned 11 production wells. We continue expanding our field infrastructure and production facilities to support further production growth. By the end of this year, the company plans to commission new steam generating facilities. We are actively striving to reduce our high viscosity oil field development costs. For instance, given the large number of wells required for the Osinsko field to reach its production target, we focused on optimizing drilling operations. Currently, we are testing the technology for drilling small diameter wells, which is likely to result in significant cost savings. The preliminary results already speak for its uh, great potential at the Osinsko field. As a reminder, this technology is now being successfully rolled out in the Urals and in the Volga region. In the first half of 2020, we launched 61 small diameter wells, a more than twofold increase year on year. Our major layer permeability fields in West Siberia increased production one and a half times year on year. I would like to make a special mention of the Sredny Nazimsko field, which doubled its production. In the first quarter of 2020, 93 production wells were commissioned at low permeability fields. We continue our efforts to cut field development costs. In particular, we increased the horizontal drilling speed of the Vladimir Vinograd field by 9% year on year, reducing the per unit drilling costs by 5%. At the Emilorsky field, we managed to increase the directional drilling speed, which um, was already high enough. The speed rose by, the, uh, by another 10% year on year, further reducing the per unit drilling costs. At the Srednyanazimsky field, we optimized the well design to increase the horizontal drilling speed by more than 25% and reduce the per unit directional drilling costs by more than 20%. Given the large number of new wells at low permeability fields, even small cost savings translate into significant capex cuts in absolute terms. In conclusion, I want to update you on um, our, the situation with our projects in Uzbekistan. In addition to a short-term decline in gas demand from China, pipeline gas turned out to be more expensive than LNG in the coronavirus pandemic aftermath which made China scale back its gas purchases in Uzbekistan. As a result, we had to gradually cut production there. Currently, our daily output amounts to 20% of the uh, design capacity, with production at Gisar project completely suspended. Also, we could not export the bulk of gas produced in 2020, sending it to the local market. Though China gradually ramps up gas purchases in Uzbekistan, our projects are yet to resume exports. 
Following our negotiations with Uzbekistan, we have achieved a preliminary agreement for the sale of gas on the local market in 2020. We also continue negotiations to resume exports. The changes in uh, gas supply terms resulted in revenue adjustments in the first quarter by 5.5 billion rubles, also translating into further revenue reduction in the second quarter. In view of a dramatic decline in production, we also, run, we also ran another impairment test. The financial model of these projects relied on conservative assumptions, which, uh, with impairment imp amounting to 36 billion rubles. Now let me hand over to Alexander Filivoda, who will present our results in the downstream segment. Thank you, Pavel. The market environment for European refineries changed sharply for the worse in the second quarter of 2020. The average benchmark margin decreased by more than twofold quarter and quarter, and even hit negative numbers at the end of the second quarter. The drivers behind the margin decline were lower crack spreads for diesel and gasoline on the back of the coronavirus pandemic aftermath, as well as faster growth of euros prices as compared to Brent prices. In July and August, the margin returned to positive territory but remained extremely Low. The economics of our Russian refineries was under pressure from the decrease of European margins and also from the low export duty differential and larger negative damper. As a result, the benchmark margin in Russia went to um, negative territory in the second quarter. I would like to note that optimized capacity utilization and high quality of our project slate helped our refineries achieve um, positive result for the second quarter. In July and August, margins in Russia returned to positive territory on the back of recovery in European margins, growing export duty differential and lower negative damper. As the refining margin decreased and the demand for jet and motor fuels declined sharply, we swiftly optimized capacity utilization at our production facilities to minimize negative effects on the market environment on the financial performance. Furthermore, extensive scheduled repairs were completed at some of our refineries. As a result, our refining throughput in the second quarter decreased by 21% uh, quarter and quarter. The decrease in the throughput at Russian refineries was, first of all, due to scheduled repairs at the Nizhny Novgorod and Ukhta refineries, which uh, coincided with poor market environment and falling demand. These were the large-scale maintenance works which are conducted once in four years. At the same time, our two best Russian refineries in Volkograd and Perm did not reduce their throughput volumes in the second quarter, so they carried on as normal. In other, in other countries, scheduled repairs were carried out at the refineries in Bulgaria and the Netherlands. Furthermore, capacity utilization at the ISAB refining facility in Italy was reduced by 20%, or about so, quarter and quarter is part of our optimization efforts in the current market environment. As the environment improved and scheduled repairs um, were completed in July, we began recovering the throughput at our facilities. In August, the throughput increased to reach 87% of the August 2019 level. We continued improving our product slate. The uh, fuel oil yield across the group dropped in the second quarter to a record low of 6%, which is two uh, percentage points better than our target for the current year and two times uh, lower in absolute volume terms than in the second quarter of 2019. And now a couple of words about our premium sales channels. Lower demand for motor fuels affected sales at our filling stations in the second quarter. Sales hit uh, the bottom in April when they were down more than 30% uh, year on year. In May, retail sales began to recover gradually as economic activity picked up in Russia and Europe. The recovery of sales continued in July and August, so the difference from the last year's figure has shrunk to about 5% for now. Recovery in Russia is going faster compared to the European chain of filling stations. The coronavirus uh, pandemic had the most dramatic impacts on the consumption of jet fuel. In April, our daily average aircraft fueling sales were down 75% of the level seen in April 2019. 
May gradual recovery, but at a much slower pace than um, motor fuel sales. For instance, um, by August, sales at the air hubs across our geographies revived to only 50% of the levels seen last August. Further growth of sales will be supported by an increase in flight numbers. In the second quarter, the difference between net back for oil refining at Russian facilities and export net back decreased to historic low due to a sharp decline in the refining margin. Our oil supplies to refineries declined in the second quarter on the back of lower throughput. At the same time, we increased deliveries of our oil to local oil facilities in Europe and thus reduced purchases of third-party feedstock in order to guarantee in order to have guaranteed placement of our own crude oil amid collapsed demand. Oil exports declined in the second quarter, mostly due to production cuts in accordance with the new OPEC Plus agreement. By contrast, exports of oil subject to a lower rate export duty increased because our high margin projects did not cut oil production. Despite the decline in margins and throughput, downstream EBITDA grew almost twofold quarter and quarter. The growth was driven by strong performance in the downstream segment outside Russia, mostly due to the carrying over effects from the first quarter. In particular, the inventories unsold in the first quarter were revalued on the back of falling prices for oil and oil products, with a negative impact on financial performance. In the second quarter, most of this impact was recovered with a positive effect on EBITDA. As a result, revaluation of inventories had almost no impact on our performance for the first half of the year. Similarly, EBITDA in the segment was affected by the factor of incoming inventories at the refineries. They were negative in the first quarter and close to zero in the second quarter. Our trading operations demonstrated record high financial results in the second quarter by capitalizing on access to markets and um, high volatility. I would like to stress that the third-party trading volumes were re reduced in order to distribute their own volumes. It is also important to mention timely optimization of the output mix and capacity utilization at our refining facilities as it minimized the negative impact of market conditions on our financial performance. However, um, Hedge accounting in our international trading operations and seasonal performance deterioration in power generation did affect downstream EBITDA. In the first half of the year, downstream EBITDA decreased by almost one-third year-on-year, mostly due to a negative effect from incoming inventories at the refineries and lower refining margins. Performance was um, uh, supported by the uh, product plate optimization and strong performance of international trading operations. Challenging, challenges posted by the coronavirus pandemic did not affect our selective projects at the refining facilities in Russia. In the delayed Koki construction project in Nizhny Novgorod, main lawn lead items have been installed. The work is now underway to install on-site pipelines and complete technological equipment strapping. The project was 75% complete as at the end of the quarter. Schedules, shed, uh, scheduled for commissioning in 2021, the delayed Koka unit will significantly improve the output mix of the Nizhny Novgorod refinery. Construction of the isomerization unit is ongoing at the same site. All major units of equipment have been delivered and are being installed. The work is underway to install metal structures, cable supports, and technological pipelines. The project was 77% um, complete as at the end of the quarter. As for the, the asphaltizing unit construction project at the Volgograd refinery, we are finishing the installation of core technological equipment and are installing technological pipelines and control valves. The project is over 80% complete. Now let me briefly outline our financial performance compared to the first quarter of uh, 2020. Revenue dropped by 41% quarter on quarter. In addition to the key factor of prices, the negative impact on revenue came from lower volumes of hydrocarbon production, a decline in trading volumes in oil and petroleum products, and also lower retail sales of petroleum products. 
On the other hand, their revenue was supported by the ruble devaluation. Despite a significant drop in uh, revenue, EBITDA was down uh, just by uh, 4% to 144 billion rubles, which was due to the factors carrying over from the first quarter. The reversal of the unhedged inventory right down was the first driver here. Let me remind you that in the first quarter, the stride down amounted to 34 billion rubles. In the second quarter, the ride down was reversed for an amount of 30 billion rubles. Hence, the effect of this driver in the first half of the year was just uh, 4 billion rubles. Another driver was uh, the positive tax lag affected, uh, affecting the Russian upstream um, after the negative tax lag effect in the first quarter. And yet another one is the inventory effects at our refineries, which I have already spoken about. The second quarter EBITDA was also supported by record high trading performance, a high share of high margin barrels in the Russian output, and the ruble devaluation. The company posted a net loss for the quarter. While its profit from operating activities was positive, the loss was due to the impairment of assets totaling 39 billion rubles, 36 billion of which are attributable to the project in Uzbekistan. A positive impact on the profit came from our FX gains on the back of the ruble appreciation versus the loss in the first quarter and lower depreciation uh, associated with lower production volumes and lower expenditures at the servicing project in Iraq. The normalized level of profit, that is net of one-off and carrying over factors, totaled about um, 10 billion rubles in the second quarter and more than 110 billion rubles in the first half of the year. Despite the challenging environment, our free cash flow was about 26 billion rubles. As a part of our contango strategy, we additionally increased our unsold oil inventory in the second quarter, which resulted in working capital growth. The free cash flow before changes in the working capital amounted to 38 billion rubles versus 10 billion rubles in the first quarter. A positive impact on the cash flow was made by a 13 billion ruble reduction in capital expenditures quarter and quarter and increase in the operating cash flow before changes in the working capital. Thank you. We are now ready to take your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw your question, please press star 2. I would like to remind you the questions from the press will not be accepted. Please ask your questions in the corresponding language, in Russian for the Russian line and in English for the English line, and you will be advised when to ask your question. Our first question comes in from the Russian line from Karen Kostanian, calling from Bank of America. Karen, please go ahead. Um, gentlemen, um, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. I have uh, two questions. One is just to clarify. Um, just to clarify your capex for the second half of the year, do I get uh, Mr. Matitsin right that we can expect a reduced share of uh, capex as compared to uh, what you had last year, or uh, did you mention the reduction in percentage vis-à-vis -vis the original budget rather than the previous year? And my other question is about your high margin barrels. I remember you um, had high hopes for the high uh, margin barrels, but given the recent initiatives of the Ministry of Finance, have you adjusted your plans in any way? And what's your vision uh, of the imputed income, whether you are going to restream uh, your capex uh, elsewhere, given the potential changes on the tax side? Thank you for your questions, uh, Karen. Our CAPEX guidance remains as is. Um, we did that uh, in the previous call, 450 to 500 billion rubles. That's what we said at the end of Q1. And you can compare uh, the numbers vis-à-vis -vis what we had at the end of the first six months, 2019. And the percentage in the presentation referred to a reduction vis-à-vis -vis the original budget for 2020. Um, 
Well, the imputed income, um, well, that is an uh, important initiative that we are talking about. The recent initiatives by the Ministry of Finance and other relevant agencies are still discussing. We believe this is the most efficient way to stimulate um, development of the um, Russian subsoil use. These are new, um, um, new um, approaches, but still uh, good stimulating measures. For example, uh, in our case, uh, we had a more than 20% rise given uh, the additional income pilot projects in some of our fields. And um, on the investment side in tier 3 projects of the kind, they went up by 24% year on year, reaching 13 billion rubles in the first six months. Um, and last year, and uh, 7 billion rubles um, this year for the first six months, uh, which is 16% up. As a result, um, these uh, blocks uh, yielded 7% more uh, last year and 9% uh, more in the first six months uh, this year. We are uh, uh, considering a significant increase in the financial aid, but uh, like uh, since the launch of the test in early 2019. As you know, we are always against any changes in the tax rules once these have been approved. The investment cycle in the oil and gas industry is um, very long and instability of the tax base does not facilitate um, sustainable development of the industry. So we hope the regulator makes a balanced decision in this regard, taking into account the interests of the subsoil users as well as the regulator himself. Thank you. Okay, the next question comes in from the line of Katia Rodina, calling from VTB Council. Katia, please go ahead. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation and um, this opportunity to ask you a question. I only have one, so it's just to follow up on the previous question and your answer to that. Considering um, um, industry stats, uh, look, oil has really increased its drilling, like 20% or so, including West Siberia. In absolute terms, it's about 1.5 million uh, meters in um, a half year. Could uh, you uh, probably give some guidance for the full year? What's your drilling target in meters or in other terms? So um, can you uh, give some guidance here? Thank you, Katerina. Um, the numbers um, that we have demonstrated that we ramped up our drilling in the first quarter, vis-à-vis -vis the first quarter of uh, 2019, uh, like that was before the pandemic, and uh, we had been going on with the original plan of high capex. In Q2, we decided to um, wind down uh, that drilling, like uh, up to 20% of the uh, Drilling plan has been moved down to Q3 and Q4 in expectation um, of uh, uh, how the OPEC Plus would be developing. I don't have uh, the numbers for the full year because, again, that is going to depend on the constraints and restrictions. We'll now move to the English line where we have a question coming in from the line of Alex Comer, calling from JP Morgan. Alex, please go ahead. Um, yes, just um, a couple of questions from me. Just on the uh, Uzbekistan um, um, gas business in terms of, of the outlook, I wonder if you could give a, uh, a little bit more clarity on, on what you think will happen um, next year and in, in subsequent years. I mean, should, should we model this? production getting back to where we were, or, or, or do you think the, 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 the market's changed 
um, in a more permanent manner. That's the first question. And then just with regard to your M&A thinking, um, you know, given where we are and uncertainty over um, the rate of demand recovery in, in future years, how are you thinking about um, your M&A? Thanks. Well, um, considering your first question um, as to how we see Uzbekistan looking forward, uh, again, the recovery in Uzbekistan is going to demand on uh, the consumption developments uh, in China. We are proceeding from the assumption that um, we are already seeing some recovery. Um, the key um, driver was uh, price because LNG – Spot prices are for LNG were lower than pipeline gas, including pipeline gas from Uzbekistan. We're expecting that pipeline gas is uh, going to be more competitive on the price side in the very near future, and China would restart procuring gas, uh, including our gas from Uzbekistan. So for now, we don't see any reason to change the volumes for the future in your models. Um, as to your second question, the M&D strategy, remains as is. Um, that's a very opportunistic strategy. We are ready to consider potential targets in uh, the regions and geographies of our presence where we have strategic interests and competences. So um, we are going to um, keep uh, analyzing potential targets uh, selectively, but it's too early to consider any announcements. Thank you. The next question comes in from the line of Ron Smith, calling from DCS. Ron, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for the call, gentlemen. Um, my question has, is on dividends. I uh, saw a bit of angst about the imputed uh, first half uh, dividend levels. Uh, could you can please confirm on the, for the full year, if necessary, you will borrow to pay out the minimum 50% of net income? Uh, is set out in your dividend policy if free cash flow is insufficient to cover it. Well, as to the dividend policy, we follow the dividend policy, which uh, suggests that we pay at least 100% uh, of the adjusted free cash flow, and there is no link to the net income in our uh, dividend policy because uh, we have changed that, and we are going to stick to the new dividend policy. Our dividend um, for the first quarter, uh, sorry, in the first six months, of course, uh, stands at 46 rubles per share according to our calculations. Now moving back. And a quick follow-up, a quick follow-up, if I may. Uh, the decision on the dividends is going to be made by the Board of Directors, which is set to meet in October this year. Thank you. Now moving back to the Russian line, where we have a question coming through from the line of Alexander Bogansky, calling from Renaissance Capital. Please go ahead. Alexander Bogansky, uh, Renaissance Capital. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. Um, well, I see that your um, dry well in Romania has been written off according to your accounts, uh, but can you uh, dwell upon the prospects of your projects in Romania, uh, especially given uh, the new discovery in Turkey? That, uh, well, that's one thing. And one other question is about fuel oil prices um, for the full year of 2020. Can you say which is uh, going uh, which share of your fuel oil production is subject to the excise duty? Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for your question, Alexander. As to our dry well in Romania and the prospects of that project and the write-off of the dry well, well, um, we are still considering the geological prospects of this particular uh, project, and it's too early to uh, make any announcements in our plans um, for the future as yet, whether we are going to carry on and in uh, what particular format. I believe we will be ready to disclose uh, further updates um, on this project uh, on this project once we have um, concluded our studies. On the excise duty for fuel oil, as we sell fuel oil um, in Russia, the new excise uh, duty that was introduced for mid dish products, um, well, it's first and foremost targeted for bunkering fuel, while uh, fuel oil um, has an immaterial or close to zero share of it that is subject to the new excise. Thank you. Thank you. Staying on the Russian line, we have another question coming through from the line of Karen Kostanian. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my apologies for asking another question. Well, just to clarify, um, the oil price has plummeted, production is limited uh, given the OPEC plus, and despite all of that, your um, CAPEX guidance floor is on par with your actual CAPEX in 2019. Frankly speaking, that is uh, not what you would typically see elsewhere with global oil and gas majors, and it is not typical for Luke Oil historically. Are you trying to build um, some um, stronghold for the future, or um, like how can it be that this year's CAPEX could be even higher than it was in a relatively well off year of 2019? Thank you. Um, thank you, Karen. Well, the rationale is pretty straightforward. We have the FX um, effect, like uh, downstream um, projects uh, have a lot of equipment that is procured in FX, so there is no reduction in ruble terms. On the upstream side, however, we have decided to um, maintain the production potential, so that's a reasonable decision and maintaining that potential uh, requires investments uh, on par with where they were in the previous year. So um, that's an extremely important matter, as we said, maintaining the production potential because we don't um, really control the uh, cons production quotas. We simply follow the rules set forth by the Ministry of Energy. We, um, uh, expecting that uh, the uh, schedule of these changes is going to stay unchanged and uh, we base our judgments and decisions on that, so we'll be moving further. Okay, thank you, understood. Staying on the Russian line, we have a question coming through from the line of Andre Gromadin, calling from Spearbank. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation and uh, an opportunity to ask uh, my questions. I have a question on Uzbekistan. Could you give um, more insights into the link between the exports volumes from your uh, projects in Uzbekistan and the total exports uh, from that country? Because Uzbekistan is exporting not only to China, Gazprom is also getting some gas from the country. Um, so would that be an even split, or is there any ratio, any other length? 
Now, the write-off that you had for your project in Uzbekistan is uh, not that grand as compared to the total investment volume. Did I get it right that it would be more about uh, one off um, delay of 2020? Uh, I, I mean, the payback period. And um, uh, and that is also linked to selling gas on the local market rather than reconsidering the global prospects uh, for these projects. Thank you. Well, the uh, right house, um, that was the case for Gestar because of our uh, production sharing agreements. Uh, we have two PSIs and um, they have certain specificity. So um, we have uh, an agreement to supply uh, gas to the domestic market for 2020 alone. We hope that starting um, from 2021, the exports volumes could recover. Negotiations with the um, Uzbekistani side uh, continues, so I cannot provide any further comments at this time. We are hopeful that in the nearest future, the official agreement will uh, be arrived at. Thank you. We have another question coming in from the Russian line from Ildar Kaziev, calling from HSBC. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. I have two questions. My first question is about your lease contract payments. You have a hike here in Q2. Is that uh, related in any way to the freight rates? And I guess it's right that the situation has got back to normal in Q3. My other question is about uh, downstream uh, margins um, and the refining margins. Uh, so it has been close to zero or even negative uh, for four or five months running. How um, long term is that? Um, and unless the demand recovers. So uh, you're represented in, you're present in many regions. I'm wondering what's your outlook across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lee Spain's, um, there is a hike indeed, and that is related to um, our freight costs for the oil and uh, oil products tankers. So the increase here is explained by the fact that we have entered into new additional agreements um, to freight the tankers so that we could um, leverage on the market environment to the fullest extent we can and um, act upon our trading strategy that we devised for the period of low demand and low oil prices. We also have an understanding that the cessation currently is uh, temporary. So um, the numbers will be going back and recover pretty soon. Um, so the contracts are short term, um, maybe not in the uh, third quarter, but in the fourth quarter, definitely we'll see some significant reductions um, in the line you're referring to. Now, the refining margin question and the market situation, frankly, the situation is rather challenging. So, uh, given that uh, local oil has a trading business and a well-developed midstream segment and great access to the markets, I th I'd say we are, um, we're less uh, incentivized um, let's pray to optimize our volumes. Just like I said, uh, we did reduce the volumes in Q2 by 21%. That was mostly driven by the fact that Q2 2020 had um, um, some um, major repair and overhaul operations planned for. That led to either full stop of the uh, operations in some refineries, or at least significant reduction in the refining volumes. And the negative margins um, that you're referring to in the uh, dramatic fall uh, 
of demand for such products as jet fuel, for example, resulted in the fact that we had to optimize our slate. I would say um, look oil um, doesn't need that much to reduce uh, its refining volumes in order to respond to the lower demand because let me reiterate it. Um, Look Oil has great access to the markets, um, it has great access to the final consumer, so we're uh, more guided by the, the dynamics of refining economics and we optimize uh, capacity utilization of the refineries to balance our financial performance. Um, as to the current situation, well, the crack spreads for um, Petrol and diesel fuel remain um, at low levels. It's hard to uh, make any forecasts in this regard, given that a lot depends on um, the future rates of recovery. On the other hand, uh, the demand um, is recovering pretty fast, if we can judge by our um, sales network. So at some point in time, uh, these developments are going to bring uh, higher crack spreads. And the lower crack spreads, at least for diesel fuel, are definitely not a sustainable trend in the longer term. Thanks a lot. We will now move to the English line, where we have a question coming through from the line of Henry Pitchcock, calling from UBS. Please go ahead. Yes, hello everyone, thank you for the update. I have a couple of follow-ups on Uzbekistan and one on refining. Um, so on Uzbekistan, I uh, just want you to check in the near term, uh, when is the earliest that you expect to be able to, to restart the export? It, it sounded like um, it could be early 2021, uh, 2021, sorry, earlier. Uh, and secondly, how much can you sell to the domestic market? Is it the 41,000 per day that you mentioned for August? Is it higher or lower than that? Uh, and then, uh, I mean, just on refining and the Nizhny Novgorod coker, when exactly do you plan to start at that unit in 2021? Thank you. Well, no, I think we have answered. Uh, it's up to 5 billion cubic meters in the domestic market. I think we mentioned that in the presentation. So that's all we can be talking about for now. Um, the start of the exports would be linked to um, increase in pipeline sales of gas to China because that's uh, the main market for Uzbekistan. So it really depends on the um, prices for pipeline gas vis-a-vis -vis prices for LNG. As to uh, the delay coca in Nizhny Novgorod, um, we can't produce the answer to the top of our heads. We'll revert to you with the precise uh, month in 2021 when we're going to start that. Okay. Um, since we don't have any further questions, we would like to thank everyone for taking part in this call and see you next time. Thank you for participating. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining today's conference. You may now replace your handsets.